Okay, this is just a reminder to turn off any noise-making devices, so please put your phones on vibrate if you haven't already. So I'm just going to introduce myself quickly. I'm the game director on Star Wars The Old Republic and have worked with uh, Bioware for about 17 years. I've been lead designer on games such as Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Neverwinter Nights, uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and Dragon Age. So today I'm going to be talking about the Old Republic and its first year. So first a few things about Star Wars The Old Republic. Right now it stands as uh, the second largest subscription-based MMORPG in the Western world. Um, since we've launched our free-to-play option, we've actually gained two million new accounts, and we're gaining um, thousands of new players, 10,000 new players every single day. Uh, we've had more than 4.5 million players uh, play the game, and I'm hoping that uh, next year at GDC I'll be able to claim that that's six, seven, or maybe even eight million players if we continue at the, uh, the rate we're going right now. But while we have a lot of success currently, uh, the year of 2012, it was a very rocky road to success, and that's what this presentation is all about, the story of that road. Now, I'm going to talk about um, leading up to launch, I'm going to talk about the first year, and then I'm going to be talking about our transition from subscription only to having a free-to-play option. So pre-launch. So back in 2006, um, the game that we were envisioning was going to be a combination of Bioware storytelling in the Star Wars universe um, with the classic MMORPG model, the classic EverQuest World of Warcraft style model. It was a hugely ambitious goal for a number of reasons. The major one was that the MMORPG genre is a very crowded field and uh, a lot of our competitors, obviously notably World of Warcraft, had years and years of time to develop content and features. And so we had a lot of catching up to do. Uh, we, unlike a lot of other companies, we didn't have an existing uh, online role-playing game engine to work on, so we had to license an unproven engine uh, to give us a head start and to get us started. Uh, another issue that arose over the course of the development was we had to ramp up to having more than 300 people on the development team, which was huge and led to a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. Um, when you have that many people working on a game, and it was nearly three times as many people um, working on a single product as Biro was used to at the time. You have communication issues, you have difficulty of um, you know, your developers feeling ownership over what they're working on, efficiency issues, and even technology issues. There's no game engine out there that's been built to really support that many game developers working on it simultaneously. Um, there was a lot of different... One example was the fact that we could often go months between playable builds. Um, the engine we were using wasn't designed natively to allow branching. That was something we had to add, and it took a long time to get that into the game. Uh, the engine did give us a head start, but we had to do a massive investment in client and server to get it to a state where we could do just basic things that an MMORPG needs. Um, for example, we couldn't even have uh, more than really 10 players in a zone at once until late 2010, early 2011, um, simply because the game performance would degrade so badly. Uh, features were very difficult to build into the game. A lot of this had to do with the fact that we had to build 170, 180 hours worth of content while simultaneously adding new features. Um, Gordon Walton, one of the GMs for our studio, always liked to make the um, uh, talk about how it was like changing out the engine of an airplane while in the middle of flight. So yeah, it was, uh, it was difficult adding features. Um, one feature I like to give as an example is the, our search function for our auction house. You'd think it would be something simple, but it actually took us four months, and um, it had to be uh, developed sequentially, and it, was, it required um, several of our best programmers to be able to do. Uh, another uh, downside of competing in um, the MMORPG space is that there is an expectation of certain features, which means that you have to spend a lot of time developing those basic features, which can take away from time uh, developing innovations and innovative features. So we really had to focus our efforts there, and we focused them towards the storytelling aspect. So we were able to get a lot of innovations there. Um, we did multiplayer uh, conversations, which was something that had never been done before. Um, we did unique uh, storylines for every single class. Um, cinematic storytelling in an online game was new. Uh, oh, here's a little aside. Um, so there's a lot of different myths about the development of Star Wars The Old Republic and the first year as well. 
um, that uh, the team gets to read. We can't really respond to in any way. I can't respond to all the myths, obviously not the financial ones or the numbers ones, but I can talk about a few, um, such as the talk that having voiceover in an online game due to the amount of content um, was ridiculous and would make the budget unbelievable and make the game impossible to build. It was actually one of the uh, easiest things during production because it was a known entity and the cost was uh, quite low in comparison to all the rest of the cost of the project. The real cost, however, of uh, adding Bioware storytelling was adding choice and consequence. So if you're building an MMORPG, you know, don't be scared of adding cool voiceover cinematic content, but do be careful about adding lots of choice with consequence because that adds to QA costs and development costs and art and design and everything. Um, another myth, people said that the game took way too long to build, but the fact of the matter is uh, MMORPGs um, take a half decade to build these days. If you look at the peers of Star Wars The Old Republic, games like Guild Wars 2, uh, The Elder Scrolls Online, uh, Terra, those games all took uh, a half decade or more in development, or are still in development to this very day. So leading up to launch, we were very confident about launching the game. We felt that we had a great game, that it, it was high quality, that it was uh, going to launch and be very stable, that we had some features that were going to differentiate us um, from the other games out there. But I would be lying if I said that you know, we didn't have any concerns. We did have um, several concerns. One of our concerns was about the Elder game. We felt um, that it wasn't as developed as much as we would have liked. It didn't have um, as many of our operations, our version of raids, as we'd like. We didn't have some important social features, such as a group finder to make finding um, groups at the Elder Game easier. And we were also notably lacking on some guild features. Our public testing uh, capability was also not as robust as we'd have liked, though it was quickly ramping up. So, but at the same time, we felt that we could deal with those issues and uh, have a very successful launch. And uh, which leads us to the game goes live. In December of 2011, we launched the game. And uh, it had an amazing launch. December was a great month um, for us, for the team. Um, Star Wars The Old Republic, we had a huge marketing push. The game was everywhere. The game was even on Wall Street. Um, we, uh, it was the fastest selling MMORPG in, in history. It, uh, we sold you know, 1.5 million plus copies uh, in the month of December. Um, we had a ton of hype. Lots of people were talking about how we were going to be the next uh, big MMORPG, that we were going to dethrone the great world of Warcraft. Um, so we were all very high at that point. Um, we also had a very stable launch, and that's, um, that's something we're particularly proud of because we had so many players coming into the game at the same time. We had millions of players um, jumping into the servers, and the servers stayed up and almost 100% of the time, which is very difficult to do when you have that many players um, in a brand new service. So team morale was very high. But, um, yes, so I have a but, there's uh, things started to turn around in the new year. Some of the, uh, uh, the risks that we had identified going into launch um, were becoming worse than we thought. The biggest thing, the biggest uh, data that we were getting, and we were getting a lot of data about the game in those first few months, mainly through in-game metrics, through exit surveys, um, through the uh, message boards, but what they were telling us um, that was the most worrisome were that people were going through the content a lot faster than we were expecting. So we had expected our player base to play through the game um, and get to the end, on average, to get to the end game in about three to four months, maybe even five months. We had 170 to 180 hours worth of content. But uh, our metrics were showing us that on average, out of our millions of players playing the game, they were going through the game at, uh, at a rate of 40 hours a week. And that was on average. We actually had people going through at 80 to 100 to 120 hours a week, which I, I can't even comprehend. But it was, uh, so we had people going through the game so fast that within one month, actually between four and five weeks, we suddenly had like close to half a million people at the, uh, at the end game. It was, uh, it was something we didn't expect at all. And when you have all those people at the end game, suddenly certain things like having only one operation and having no group finder become a much bigger challenge than uh, what we thought they were going to be. Uh, our first game update um, also had a little bit of a hitch. We launched uh, open world PVP on the world of Ilum, but we had a, a small bug 
Uh, it was actually a bug that took approximately two minutes to fix, but we didn't find it because our public test um, was not as robust as we had liked it to be. The next month it was robust and we would have caught it, but we didn't catch it and that first update gave us a little bit of a black eye because our open world PVP didn't turn out um, the way we wanted it to. We also had a lot of demand. Fans were demanding the core MMO features, especially the fans who were reaching the Elder game. They wanted to see a group finder. They wanted to see more guild features because they wanted more to do. They'd finished the level up game. They wanted more stuff. And uh, what was happening was um, a lot of our, our most hardcore players, our opinion leaders and opinion leader guilds were reaching the Elder game and they weren't liking what they were seeing or they were going through the content too fast and they were starting to churn out. And because they were opinion leaders, um, you know, that was starting to create a cascading effect. By April, we had a, another patch which we had nicknamed, the, or actually the, the press had nicknamed the Jesus patch, um, which addressed some concerns, but April was five months into the game, which is a little bit too late for, um, uh, for a lot of reasons, and as well, it didn't address the issue of not having a group finder or the fact that by this time, some of our servers, because we had opened so many up at, the, at launch, were feeling a little bit empty. So it was rough times. Um, you know, we announced in uh, May that we were down to 1.3 million subscribers. Um, we also had to start going through a series of layoffs in the company, which obviously had a, a devastating effect on morale. Um, we're, we had ramped up to more than 300 people to, uh, to launch the game, and unfortunately that's kind of a standard practice for AAA studios building big games nowadays. Um, but because of uh, the downward trend of subscribers, we weren't able to support that size of team. So we had to bring the team size down to something that was uh, um, more realistic. At the same time, we, had, uh, we were still working on the game, a lot of different features, um, new Elder content, and we, had, we were working on some things that were the seeds of change that were gonna help us um, actually turn the service around in the future. When we released them, they didn't have an immediate impact, but uh, with our third update, we introduced uh, both the group finder that we were looking for and also free character transfers, which allowed players to transfer off of servers that were starting to feel empty to more populated uh, servers. Both of these um, aspects were going to be very important in making the service feel a lot better because one of the major things you want in an MMORPG is the feeling that there's lots of players um, playing with you and an easy way of finding friends to adventure with. We were also at this point um, we were uh, formulating a brand new strategy for the rest of the year, and that strategy was going to center around adding a free-to-play option to Star Wars The Old Republic, adding microtransactions, um, and also upping the speed at which we made updates, because we realized that at the speed that we were currently doing updates was far too slow. It was taking us two to three months to get an update out, and that was really making our fans feel that we weren't responsive and that uh, our service was uh, slow and sluggish, and we had to turn, uh, turn that opinion around. So July, August was kind of the low point um, for our studio for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, churn was still, um, our subscribers were still going down. Uh, Ray and Greg, who were the founders of Bioware and respected amongst uh, everyone in the company, announced the retirement. Um, we had had to let go hundreds of our friends um, during the, uh, the layoffs. Um, Guild Wars 2 was being hailed as like the be all end all of um, MMOs coming out. Um, you know, Mists of Pandaria was going to kick us in the crotch. It was all looking bad. The journalists were like uh, predicting our demise and uh, we really felt that uh, launching our free-to-play option was our best and biggest opportunity to, ch to turn things around, to turn the service around, to turn opinion around and to get our fans back on our side. So free-to-play. So we had uh, um, the, one of the first orders of business we had in Star Wars was uh, for the free-to-play launch, obviously, was developing the free-to-play system itself. Um, the second thing was we really needed to focus on improving the frequency of our content delivery. But third, we had to make sure that the service itself was a lot stronger um, uh, than it currently was. We wanted to make sure that when we went free-to-play, we were gonna probably have millions of players either return or new players come into the game, but we wanted to make sure that the service was a lot better um, when they came than when they had left in, say, April, May, or June. So turning the service around, um, uh, there was a bunch of different things we did to make the game uh, more enjoyable throughout and mainly at the Elder game. 
But probably the biggest and most important thing we did was the character transfers uh, that we started in June, and then the server merges we did in September. It's just uh, when you're playing in an MMORPG, it's so important that you have a critical mass of players uh, on a server. You need to feel like you're in the community, that the server is vibrant, that there's lots of players around you. Um, the other thing was the group finder. Um, we needed to have, when you're at the Elder game, because of the way the Elder game is uh, built, you, know, you have to essentially form a group if you're going to enjoy any of the content. All the content, for the most part, is group-based. Um, you need a way to form a group, and a group finder is um, uh, very important to that. We had also improved, uh, obviously increased the scope of the Elder game. We had added a lot of different operations over the course of the year and different flashpoints and different activities, new PvP war zones. So there was a lot more to do um, for players when they came back. So we felt that with all of these things combined, we had essentially created an experience that was going to be a lot better for returning players and also for new players. For the free-to-play option itself, we had to, you know, when we were discussing that, we had to be very careful about it because Star Wars The Old Republic wasn't built originally to be a free-to-play game. It was built to be a subscription game. And all of our money was coming um, from subscriptions. If we got rid of those, the studio wouldn't survive. We needed the, you know, the money um, coming from subscriptions to be able to uh, support the cost of the business. So we had to come up with a system that made um, subscribers a core of the business, but we also had to have an option that brought in new players. And uh, players, the biggest um, barrier for new players trying out Star Wars at that time, we constantly got this, was simply giving out their credit card information. Players didn't want to give out their credit card information. So we had a free trial already, but a free trial is different from giving out the whole game for free. So we essentially, the, the uh, free to play option was like a giant um, free trial where you got to play the whole game um, from levels one to 50 for free. We had to also figure out how we were going to monetize free-to-play players. The fact is, when you have uh, millions of players uh, playing the game who aren't paying any money, you want to get some money, or aren't paying any subscription, you want to get some money out of them um, to be able to essentially uh, pay for the costs of, of the service that you're providing. And we felt that um, having an like, uh, in-game item uh, marketplace for that would be great. We call it the cartel market. You could buy all sorts of items there. But the number one thing that we sold was uh, cartel packs. Those were by far our most successful um, uh, item that we sold in the uh, cartel market. And the packs were inspired by um, the packs sold in uh, EA's own FIFA game, uh, but also, uh, obviously, trading card games. Um, I'm sure there's lots of fans of games like Magic the Gathering in the crowd right now. The great thing about uh, our cartel packs was that they were an optional activity. You didn't have to buy a single pack, and you could still enjoy the game. But um, there was a lot of players who would buy them. And there was a lot of players who would actually spend hundreds of dollars on packs. So we had our strategy. Um, we had started like, uh, doing the development in, uh, during the summer. And come November, we had got everything in place. And we did our free-to-play launch. We kept expectations realistic. We didn't want to um, have expectations too high which was good because when we came out of the gates, we blew all the expectations out of the water. Uh, November and December, uh, again, December was a very happy and, uh, uh, time for, for the studio. Morale went um, high because our results were amazing. Our subscri uh, subscribers stopped going down. They bounced and they started going up. The concurrency on the servers went way up, uh, a huge amount. And uh, they kept on, both um, statistics kept on rising um, from November all the way till now. So it's been, the, the free-to-play launch was extremely successful. And uh, the cartel packs as well were a lot more successful than we thought. We knew they were going to, we were pretty, well, we didn't know. We were confident that they were going to do well, but, uh, but they did much better than we expected. So how did, why, you know, how and why did the free-to-play option turn things around? Well, uh, as I was saying before, uh, the free-to-play option is like the ultimate trial. You basically, you hear about Star Wars The Old Republic, and you hear that, yeah, you can play Star Wars The Old Republic. You don't have to spend $50 on a box copy. You don't have to give you your credit card information. You can just download it and play it. And uh, so you can play the game. And then once you become engaged with the game, 
um, you know, you um, can transfer to becoming a subscriber. Obviously, we've placed some limitations on uh, players who are playing from levels 1 to 50. Um, there needs to be. There needs to be some reason for wanting to trans um, transform into a subscriber. But for the most part, um, playing the level up game is, uh, is pretty fun um, as a free-to-play player. Once you get to the Elder game, though, it really um, is kind of incumbent on you to become a subscriber if you're really going to enjoy that aspect of the game. Uh, so what about microtransactions? Um, why did they turn things around? Why were they so successful? Well, they, we took everything that was uh, essentially popular about collectible card games, and we applied them to, uh, to our packs. And you know, they really leveraged that sense of discovery that you have in collectible card games, you know, up, opening up the card pack and you know, discovering, did you get the item you were looking for or didn't you? Um, and we found out, uh, well, one of the things we expected um, was that if we didn't have a secondary market for our cartel packs, much like collectible card games have a, a secondary market and FIFA's card games have a secondary market, we wouldn't be successful. So all of the items that you get from your cartel packs are actually, you can sell them on our version of the auction house, the Galactic Trade Network. And so that means if, um, if you're a person who spends hundreds of dollars on packs looking for you know, that ultimate rare item that you really want, you don't feel totally cheated that you get all these items you don't want because you can take those items and you can put them on the auction house and uh, sell them for in-game money. Also, um, if you're a player who doesn't want to buy cartel packs and feels that it's like, you know, again, I'm paying my subscription, it's stupid that I should have to pay for cartel packs, you don't have to either because you can go to the auction house and use your in-game cash to uh, buy items from the cartel packs. Um, some other things, uh, you know, other than, uh, we had a system in our items called the mod system. That actually was a, a godsend for us because it allowed us to sell gear appearances um, without selling power. We felt that if we were selling power that we'd get that whole pay to win backlash that would be, well, that's really awful. We didn't want that. Um, and what we found was, other than our cartel packs, our outfits were actually our second biggest seller. So I think I have to wrap up here. So where are we now? So we're in a really good place at the studio. Um, we have, uh, we're the second biggest subscription MMORPG in the Western world. Um, we have two million new accounts um, since we launched Free to Play. We have thousands of new players trying out the game every single day. I get to read those reports and every single day and they make me happy. Uh, we make significant amount of money from the cartel market. It's uh, probably, uh, for microtransactions, one of the biggest microtransaction um, money makers that EA has. Our elder game is very robust. It's easier to find uh, groups that you need to, uh, in order to enjoy the elder game. It's a lot more fun than it used to be. We have a game development team that is smaller, but it's a lot more agile, a lot more engaged, feels more ownership, and uh, is able to be a lot more efficient. And we also have a really good plan uh, moving forward into the next few years. And our plan includes expansion packs. We have an expansion pack launching in the next couple weeks called Rise of the Hut Cartel, which adds five new levels, some, some of the best storytelling and cinematics we have um, launched in the game yet, some new gameplay mechanics that um, are new to Star Wars The Old Republic. We also have um, expansions beyond that that we haven't announced that are even more exciting, where we're able to do innovative things that you haven't seen in other MMORPGs, things that are you know, more focused on the Star Wars license. We also have a very loyal and dedicated fan base, which is important for us to continue to be successful. Those, uh, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of players who you know, started playing the game back in December of 2011 that are still with us now. They're very loyal, and we need to uh, obviously keep them because they're our most dedicated players. We also have a team that has a ton of experience um, under its belt. Some of our team members have been working on the game for seven years. Some have been working on online games for close to 10 or a dozen years. We also have a studio that uh, is the cornerstone for um, EA's online RPGs moving forward. So we have a studio and a team that's capable of building online RPGs that just aren't Star Wars, but other things. But finally, and probably most importantly, um, we have a player base that's uh, much more satisfied with what they see. Um, the community is a lot more positive than they have been in the past. And uh, the studio itself uh, is, has a very high morale. So it's, uh, it's good times right now. And I'm hoping that uh, next year I'm able to do a similar presentation, perhaps on the second year of uh, our MMORPG. Anyways, that's it. Thanks.